and this is sort of very consistent with um, you know what we I think what generally the community has seen um, over the years, which is that um, you know there are fairly robust components for a day in access band that have gotten already wide wide deployment with higher ed, namely CAS and SHIB, maybe open LDAP, um, and um, and yet there's still a few components that um, kind of need need to work on, and, and Grouper I think is one of the next ones that can that can really get wide deployment and have a real impact in the way that the CAS and SHIB has um, to lots of lots of places. So, um, okay, so I've got a set of slides I'll, I'll run through to kind of give us sort of the background and intro um, to Grouper. Some of you may have seen some of these slides with the presentations. We've tried to kind of pull together um, a few of them, a few of them um, for this session. Um, so just a reminder again, you know, please ask questions at any time along the way. It's going to be a long afternoon. If all we're doing is up here is, is doing all the talking, so so please jump in and help steer us in the right direction. Um, so okay, so without further ado, um, a day access management. Um, so I have, I've got a sub, couple slides up here, uh, bar from a uh, presentation from Tom Barton. So thanks, Tom, for that for these slides. Um, you know, really trying to kind of trying to make this simple about what IAM is. Um, you know, you need to have an identity. Um, you need a way to authenticate to online systems. Um, those systems need a way to authorize you to do the kinds of things that you're allowed to do. Um, and you need some access management. You need a way to sort of map policy and authority to authorization in a way that scales um, and suits the diversity of use cases that we find in higher ed and research. Um, so, you know, it's about tools and processes to translate IAM and the concepts in typical campus environments. Now, what I was getting at. So, um, I hope you're familiar with it, with this diagram. It's kind of a you know, reference IAM high-level IAM architecture that's come out of Internet 2 middleware. Um, it's been really useful for, for lots of campuses and, and and lots of projects in trying to orient, you know, where what, what are the functional uh, scope of various components in IAM architecture and how do you put them all together so that you have a, a coherent functioning system. And the, what I got circled up there right now is sort of where we're focused on this afternoon. Um, this is sort of authorization and group management, and where Grouper really does a really great job of, um, of filling in these these features and functions. Um, so you know, how do we get policy? How do we turn that into authorization and groups um, in a way that's manageable and scalable and uh, that you can inspect? Um, how do we how do we manage those groups? Managers' privileges and make it easy to make use of institutional data to drive some of those things um, and, and push it out to systems uh, that can make use of it. So, why have an access management strategy at all? Um, that'd be a good question. Um, one is to lower cost and time to deliver new service. Um, I think we're all likely to be struggling with um, uh, the advent of cloud based services, which I think. To talk about internet-based services, but um, you know, a lot of campuses are trying to deploy Google Apps or, or, or Microsoft hosting or other hosted service providers. And so, how do we how do we manage all the groups and be able to deploy those services in a cost-effective way and timely way? Um, simplify and make consistent by using the same group enroll in many places. So that's that's kind of what I was getting at. So I think we've all had the challenges of you know just even a, a course roster or class roster. And how many different ways that has to be provisioned in various systems? Um, if we don't have a, a, an effective way of managing those and deploying those, um, it could be a real burden. Um, empowering the right people to, to manage access. Um, you know, right now, when we have a lot of ad hoc integration, that tends to pull in a lot of our IT staff to basically keep that work, keep that working, and, and manage. And what we really like to have is a system that can be deployed more as a service so that we get it out to the hands of folks who actually have the responsibility to manage the various authorities. So some kind of distributed access management. Um, and also see who can access what. So this is kind of the security side of, of Google that your CISO might be interested in. Um, you know, so, so one aspect is the collaboration and enablement part of authorization management. And the other access, that other side is the security side. Having, having a centralized access management system gives us the ability to, 
say, hey, this person at this time had access to these various services. Um, so access management strategies tend, tend to follow a few stages. Um, and uh, given the discussion we had uh, in the beginning, where it sounds like most folks have some form of a robust enterprise directory service, whether that's Open LDAP or 389 or, or Active Directory or some combination of those two things, it's likely that you have a directory service that has affiliations or some attributes that you can use to, to drive sort of coarse grain authorization. So, you know, if you had a, a staff portal, you could look up an LDAP and say you only let folks that uh, have faculty or staff affiliation to access the portal. Um, so, so the next next step out of that is, you know, perhaps maybe we could do course rosters or, or, or faculty groups, um, have a group affiliation in that EDS and have that drive access to a variety of services. Um, and of course, once you start to do that, then you realize, well, there's always exceptions to the rules. So even if I have this nice little Python or Perl script somewhere um, populating active directory groups that um, at some point, there's going to need to be exceptions to the rules, either because the institutional data doesn't support um, the rule, um, or you just need kind of manual add-on intervention. You know, so say maybe the professor wants somebody to audit a course that's never going to end up in your SIS, or maybe it's uh, in your enterprise directory. So it always seems to be need a, a reason for exceptions. Um, so um, then, so the next thing. Next evolution is really sort of basically the increased integration of access management. So, um, you know, once once you get a taste of uh, being able to leverage groups and institutional data in that way, then you know every system you, you turn up, you want to figure out a way to get that integrated in a scalable way. So, um, kind of that's the, the background driver for groups, centralized groups management and authorization strategy. So maybe I'll just pause here for a second and just ask for feedback. Does that ring true to folks? Do folks have other sort of perspectives on um, what maybe what brought you to this room or on group management generally or other other challenges related to group or authorization strategies? This all sounds familiar. Well, it seems like everybody has their own home grown solution, which means there's not one product there. So that's an interesting question, an interesting statement. So the, the, the statement was that it seems like everybody, and certainly everybody in this room it sounded like, right, as we went around the, around the horn here, um, everybody has some mechanism for do, homegrown mechanism right now for doing sort of this group management. And, and maybe that's based on Active Directory or Open LDAP or, or, or PeopleSoft or some combination of scripts or, um, and, and so the, the point was made, well, everybody's got their homegrown solution. Maybe that's, and not, everybody's not running this, this, this on the same sort approach or product. And maybe that's because everybody has their own requirements or needs or there isn't a solution that can satisfy everybody's requirements or needs. Or I, I don't know. One of the things that really rang through to me was that uh, right now, you know, we, we do have a lot of central IT involved. It's a very ad hoc kind of provision situation. And uh, this whole concept, I don't know where everybody else is, but this whole concept of being able to delegate that out so that other departments and users can actually do it do it by themselves. I don't know if anybody has a good homegrown solution for that right now. We certainly don't. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're looking at group words, because, yeah, we can get these people to pick off and say, we need this, 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 and this, and we can get all go do that, Robert, or look at that. Right. Right. But that's what we're trying to get out of, because I see a movement like that. Right. Distributed management as yeah. well. I'd also say when we, when we all started collectively, we didn't know any better to know that we no. needed something like group where you have to kind of go through a learning curve yeah. to realize all the constraints that you have. So that's an interesting point. So there's some there's some kind of maturity level internal identity access management teams or central IT teams. We don't have an IAM team yet. Um, kind of need to kind of go th go through some of these stages to get to that kind of place where they realize that hey, we really need some kind of something like Gruber that would satisfy. It's like a developer that wants to write their own framework all the time and then they realize that, yeah, <coughs> I've, I've, I've done this 10 times, I'm done. Right. I'm just going to use somebody else's. Cool. All right. So, um, so a little bit, little bit of background about around the Gruber 
the Gruber story, as it were. Um, of course, open source, Apache 2 license, community-driven project of Internet 2. Um, initial release in 04, and 1.6 release in 2006. Um, anyway, been around, been around for quite a while, and um, it already has a lot of an adoption. So already, already a quite mature open source project. Um, so some of the key the key aims about the delegated uh, distributed management, um, you know, really how can we how can we enable and provide a service um, for folks to, to do this kind of distributed authorization management and, and still have it uh, managed well. Um, and the second point I think is really key, and I think really key also to really any of the open source middleware components that we've seen come out of higher education, which is integrate into existing IDM infrastructure. Right? So, um, you know, so whether you have a proprietary enterprise directory service, or you've got proprietary um, source systems, or target systems, or um, any component of your current IAM stack, these systems tend to work with those. Um, CAS, SHIB, Uber, Open Registry, and others. Um, so you know it's not um, it's not like you have to adopt them all at once. You know you can adopt them, you can adopt them as, as you see fit. So I think it's one of the real key, real key, real key points about Grouper. Um, so a little bit more. So um, Grouper originally was all about just managing groups of people, um, and still I think. Just getting a handle on group management at an institutional level is a huge win, a huge value add. So if you adopted Grouper and you did nothing but manage groups, I think there's still a ton of, a ton of value there just in making that step. Um, but it goes further now. Um, it includes rules and permissions, and uh, roles and permissions and rules. And um, uh, roles and permissions allow you to do really sophisticated fine grained access control really sophisticated way, so we'll get to that a little, little bit later. Um, the rules add issue is really cool too, because you can start to do things that um, are required in some of the standard RBAC models, so um, things like separation of duties or deep provisioning out of groups can be um, implemented using using rules and which is really, really exciting. Uh, well, exciting for IAM geeks, I guess. Um, so, this is a, a partial list of, of organizations that have been involved in Grouper and made contributions so far. So a lot of folks are involved um, both in deployment um, and support and development of Grouper. Uh, Unicon uh, announced at the 2012 Internet 2 member meeting, so I guess about last, last year, that we were adding Grouper to our portfolio of, of systems that we provide uh, commercial uh, support for open source software. So that was, that was pretty exciting, and we continue to get um, uh, deeper involved in the Google project. Okay, so that's background. Um, so, so some of the core concepts. So all about managing groups. Um, so you know, if you're familiar with, with directories generally, um, uh, Grouper has uh, a folder structure. In some of the documentation, you'll see these folders referred to as stems. Um, and and really what each one of those is a, is a context for, for authorization around managing Grouper itself, okay? So if you have admins who add a folder, then you can manage groups um, and members and configuration under that folder. So you can create this great wide tree and, and provide distributed management for those, for the folders and for, for Grouper configuration under those. So you can not only have um, central IT manage that stuff, but you can delegate that stuff out to other departments. So it's kind of really this is two levels really of delegated management. Delegation of grouper configuration itself, um, as well as sort of delegation of authorization management for individual services. So there's groups. Groups can have direct members. Um, groups can have subgroups, in which case uh, those members become indirect members. And then one of the more powerful features of, of grouper is the group map. Right? So you can have these composite groups we have included in XML. So security and delegation, um, and again, this is about delegation around managing the Grouper instance itself. Um, so 
Um, on the folders, folks, you can delegate, uh, create groups, and create subfolders, and, and a variety of, of um, features on the on the group instance itself. So moving beyond groups, this is, uh, starts to become advanced uses of the grouper, um, is roles and permissions. And there's this rich uh, role inheritance, and a hierarchy that you can implement for uh, actions and, uh, and roles that uh, we'll get into a little later. Um, but there's, there's a model here that really extends to be able to use to use fine-grained authorization. Um, and when I first finally kind of really got and understood this, it was kind of really a, a, a wow moment for me a bit because um, really what's been implemented here um, is an extensible authorization model that um, if you're building any in-house systems, any new in-house systems that you're building, um, every single one of them is going to have some kind of authorization you really should take a look at Grouper for storing that and managing that data. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this, but uh, we've been spending quite a bit of time looking at the attribute framework versus uh, custom group types. Is the custom group types kind of being deprecated in favor of the attribute framework? We'll be getting more detail about that later. Uh, in 2.2, the custom group types are going oh. to be replaced for you. So, yes. I would, I would definitely recommend going to the attribute framework. So, Chris, would you mind maybe just giving, giving the rest of the group maybe just a little bit of context about the question and the answer? Yeah, basically, um, I think ever since I've been involved with the project, there was a way to assign a group type, which is just basically a label to a group, and then you can put uh, attributes with names and values on that assignment of the group type. And um, basically, it wasn't really flexible enough. Only admins can do it. Um, you couldn't have multi-valued assignments. You know, there are a bunch of other things that made it sort of inflexible. So uh, a few years ago, we created what we call the attribute framework, where you can assign attributes to not only groups, but to folders and to people, people memberships, um, you can assign attributes to attribute definitions. And you can also assign them to the assignments of any of those. Um, so the, um, it's pretty much a superset of the functionality, implemented a little bit different, differently. Um, and now we're at the point where we want to replace the legacy with the new. So, um, so we have a plan. There's something on the wiki about it, about how it's going to work specifically. Um, but basically, with the upgrade to 2.2, .2, we're going to migrate all of the group types and attribute assignments to the new attribute framework. Um, but if you get started with the attribute framework, it'll be exactly how you want it. The way it's migrated, you might have to go in and tweak some of the stuff. So, so it's, I think it was a very timely question, because I think it, it speaks to, again, I think some of the power of Grouper here um, that goes very deep. And so, because I think what, maybe one way to characterize what we're talking about here with the, with the group types and the, and the attributes um, is really an extensible authorization data model, right? So with the group types, you have kind of hard-coded attributes that you can assign to groups, but with the attribute framework, you can extend it to any attributes that you want, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> group types and attributes, only admins can manage those. With the new attribute framework, anyone who has um, create privileges of a folder, can create their own attribute definition that no one else will see. They can create privileges about who's allowed to see it or, or administer and assign it, um, see the assignments. Um, so it's a lot more flexible. Yeah, I think it, it dovetails nicely kind of with the point that I was also trying to make about if you're building any kind of in-house system, no doubt it's going to have some, at any, at any level of sophistication, it's going to have some kind of authorization component or requirement. Um, and you would really do well, I think, to, to start to look at, at this model of leveraging Grouper and its database when it's stored, because you, you can gain all sorts of benefits from that, um, from kind of automatically provisioning, making use of the reference data groups, um, the rules with it, which, are, with it, which are in there, um, and then the management interface for the authorization stuff, you know, somewhat comes, comes to free rather than have to yet build again another kind of group management or authorization. So a couple of 
some things about grouper. Um, this sort of idea of life cycle support. Um, you know, memberships in various groups can have start end times. You can rearrange the tree. You can move folders around. You can move groups around. Um, it has user audit, so you know, as admins are affecting um, the configuration and behavior of Grouper itself, it's not tracked. Um, has a really cool uh, thing called point in time audit, um, so that you can kind of go back in history and ask, you know, which if, about a particular user, what permissions or roles or groups were they assigned to uh, in the past. And then it has the rules that we're talking about. So I can trigger um, adding a person or removing a person or adding permission or removing a permission um, you know, based on um, when they fall out or are added to uh, various groups. So um, I got the next kind of set of slides um, talk through some of the functional use cases that I think arise, that arise out of and one is this distributed authorization management that we started talking about earlier. Um, and I think this, this is kind of a, a slide that from, from Tom Barton. I, I love this slide because I think it really pulls together a lot of the in various aspects of power of the group. So um, the problem is we want to authorize access to the VPN. Okay? And um, what we would like to have is a very simple rule for the, for the VPN access points. Right? We would love to have just maybe a a singular attribute in our LDAP directory that says VPN authorized. If you have that attribute, then you get access to the VPN. So the access rules of the VPN are very, very simple, right? It's a very simple LDAP filter. Um, but we know, all know that to the actual business rule about, and policy around who gets access to the VPN can be very complicated and likely not written down and likely to have lots of exceptions from time to time. Um, and and so how do we how do we how do we how do we deal with that kind of complexity and behavior. Um, and I think Grouper is, is a great answer to it. Um, so on the, the right side of that diagram, you see the eligible box. And um, these are all the folks who might be eligible for VPN. And the first three, staff, student, and postdoc, um, are automatically created in Grouper, um, likely be the Grouper loader, right? So these are what we might, what we might call reference data groups. Um, this is data coming out of um, your student information system, your HR system, um, that says, hey, this person has this affiliation, they're a student, a staff, a postdoc. If they're in that group, then they automatically get into the eligible group for the VPN. The, the last bot box, the, the bottom box there, the IRB, um, this is some group, some affiliated group with your institution. Um, maybe it's institutional research, but separate. Maybe it's foundation, maybe it's friends of the university, some kind of group or affiliation where folks aren't necessarily in your core SIS or HR system, but, but they need to get access to the VPN, right? Um, and, and perhaps and, and perhaps that list is managed manually um, and kept on the side of the spreadsheet or something. So um, so this is folks kind of adding that ad hoc um, to the eligible group. Next to that, the deny group. I have two groups. One is the, the closure group. So um, if you have an open, uh, a registry system or an IDM system, you might have some life cycle around managing um, uh, the accounts for people, right? So you have an open status, a closed status. Maybe you have a, a status in between there called closure, where you think the person left, like the HR system said they left, but um, maybe they actually didn't leave. Maybe they're just in between grants or something. Um, so you really don't want to turn them off. but. But maybe you want to start turning stuff off just to make sure that they are still here or they're gone. So um, you know, maybe you might dial back their VPN access. If they raise their hand that they're still here, then you, then you, then you turn that back. Um, and then you might have something that we used to finally call it at Rutgers, the, the big red button, where you know, for, for some kind of security issue or for calls or for whatever reason, um, you want to turn down access for that individual immediately, um, you know, regardless of what the student information system might say or any other sort of piece of so you might want to have a button on your, on your group or management screen that says, you know, put these person in the lock group, and that would, would turn off the VPN access to them. So, so Gruber manages um, data coming in to create these references groups. It provides a, a facility to do the ad hoc management in the IRB office. Um, it provides the functionality to do the group map to arrive at the final designation of the VPN authorized. So I think this is really greatly captures the good uh, power of uh, good, uh, power of the group. 
and it has the power to then publish that VPN authorized out into an LDAP directory where the VPN can uh, so Yes, yes. So the VPN authorized, in particular in this, this example, would then be published out to an LDAP directory. I have a question about that. Yeah. So that implies that you have an attribute of value, a VPN value is authorized. Cooper mostly puts people in active directory or LDAP groups. So wouldn't that really be expressed as member of VPN? It could, yeah. And I have not figured out a way to set a specific attribute with either the PSP or any other method from Cooper back to the active directory. And that may be more nuanced or detailed than we need to go into right now. No, I think it's, that's a great question. And, and in fact, in this case, although there's a colon in there that's not meant to imply name, attribute, value there. Um, and in fact, I think the deployment scenario for this, because you heard me wrong, pre, I'm pretty sure this is a member of attribute on that entry. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions about, about this model? Because I think this really does get to the heart of some of the value that we're doing. Speaking of some, how does your model work? How does the Blueberry connect to that? And specifically, how does that happen? Is that part of Blueberry, or do you have to cross the program? The question was, how does Blueberry connect to LDAP? Yeah, I mean, automatically it pushes the changes in LDAP. Yeah. Is that a cost of development? Chris, you want to take a stab at it? It's like the people from Utah answering them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, there's something, there are a couple of ways to do it. Um, the latest way is called the PSP, Provisioning Service Provider. And that's software that um, you need to configure based on how your LDAP is set up. And that part is kind of complicated, but, but it, it shouldn't require any programming. But that PSP comes with Comes with Grouper. Yeah. That'll that'll go to um, to an LDAP or an AD. So this is a good question. So where do, you, where do you source your institutional data to create the groups in the first place, right? And um, um, it can source that data from LDAP. You can source that data from just about anywhere, right? So there's these things that Chris will get to later on called grouper loader jobs um, that you can configure to, to pull um, groups from, from various sources. So one of those sources might, in fact, be your enterprise directory service, right? You might have, you know, maybe, maybe your current IAM architecture you know, maybe you don't have a person registry in place quite yet. And so maybe you've got a bunch of scripts that are calculating affiliation, say, and just putting that in your EDS. But now I want to derive groups in Grouper based on affiliation. Well, so I, I would probably create a Grouper letter job that loads those affiliation groups into Grouper from my, from my LDAP, my EDS, do group, Grouper magic like this, create, you know, VPN authorized, and then have Grouper be authoritative for VPN authorized or a member of you know, back into the into the EDS, you're kind of going all around. So the um, the PSP that I was just talking about, provisioning service provider, that's supposed to be a generic provisioning software component, and Grouper can be a source or a destination, and LDAP can be a source. So you could use that to sync changes between LDAP and Grouper, and like Bill just said, the Grouper loader can also sync changes either from a SQL database or an LDAP. And with LDAP, if you Google uh, Grouper Loader LDAP, it'll tell you all about it. But basically, there are three three ways you can do it. You can have an LDAP filter that um, just returns a list of people to put in a group. You can have an LDAP filter um, that returns um, groups and people. Like it returns a list of groups, and inside those groups has an attribute with a list of people. And you can return um, a list of people that have attributes of what groups they should be in. So if the attributes are, you know, staff, student, whatever, it would create a staff group of student groups. Do you need a shipless to release the uh, attributes in this case? Excuse me? Oh, do you use the uh, shipless to release the attributes? 
So sh 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 do we use shibboleth to release the attribute? So so that's just the attribute that comes from LDAP to create your groups based on. And then with shibboleth, um, you can use you can. So at Pen, we use shibboleth and we release um, affiliation data that comes from groups and group work. It's kind of unrelated from getting data from LDAP into the group into grouper, but you could um, we have a, a SQL feed that um, Shibboleth uses to populate the um, affiliation, you know, staff student or whatever from group of groups, and then also entitlements based on group memberships. Yeah, it's a good question, right? Because so once once you have grouper configured with these reference groups and you've done the configuration to do these kind of um, sophisticated sort of group logic. And I actually finally have something like VPN authorized. Um, how, how do you make use of that? How do you make use of that authorization data? In a particular example, we were talking about pushing back to LDAP. Um, um, in, but maybe you're pushing back to, to some kind of um, uh, authorization uh, cache, you know, maybe some RDBMS tables. Um, and maybe you're making that available via, via ship uh, SAML artifact or some other. So there's, I think there's a variety of ways that you can consume um, and make use of the data once Another, another example, and this was one that, that uh, Chris worked out, so he's got some more examples of this kind of later on. Um, I didn't work up to that code. No, <coughs> that was, must, must be the uh, projector. Um, uh, so deprovisioning, right? We hear this all the time. Unicom does these IAM assessments from time to time for campuses, and, and always on campus, deprovisioning is always a big, big issue and problem because um, what? Um, but, you know, for, you know, e even for folks that are still at the university, right, there's this idea of sort of you just accrue permissions through your lifetime, and, you know, if you've been there long enough, you probably have access to every system on campus, um, let alone folks who have you know, retired or, or moved on from institutions. So, um, uh, so you know, this is, this is trying to show um, uh, some grouper mechanism to say that only active fac faculty members can, can log into the grading application. Um, within Grouper, you might have this grading faculty role created that has these permissions. Um, and to be in that role, you'd be required, you can't see it here, but this is kind of showing Grouper loader and institutional community, institutional groups. And so if you fall out of the faculty group in Grouper, then you would automatically lose permission for, for the grading job. Um, I'm just curious, for example, for the people in for the group, how do you handle the life cycle? Because some of the apps, for example, our third-party vendor, and they are still needing the group information. We don't just deprovision right away. We have to let them to continue to serve the student after graduation. So what kind of life cycle we can use here? So it depends what your requirement is for each application. So if you have an application that needs a list of people, you're not going to send them just your list of students. You're going to send them a group that's specifically created for that application that might contain the list of students and maybe some other things. And um, so, for instance, in our engineering school, they wanted um, they wanted students to come out of the wiki group after they have been out of the course for a week. Because if you just get out of the course, you still might need to go to the wiki for a little while. So we used a group <coughs> rule that says once you're taken out of this um, course group, assign an end date to the membership of the wiki group to one week in the future from whatever now is. And that's how they handle that. Um, for other deep provisioning, you might just have an intersection with your active employee group or your active member group, and it might be automatic. But it depends on, on you know, whatever the requirements are for that. Can you do the extension? For example, they request 30 days extension or 60 days? Yeah, you can put whatever, however many days you want. You're talking about the rule? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a rule. Or can we make it like? Days or yeah, um, if you go to the Grouper, grouper Rules uh, wiki, um, it talks about that, but that's that's a field that you fill in to put what the time, the amount of time is. Oh, great question. I'm seeing that. Uh, okay, so um, amazing that the time is kind of flying by on this. Um, 
So, uh, see, I won't belabor this one, but before I was talking about some of the fine grained permissions model, um, and we spent a little time talking about that, but you know, again, if you're doing any kind of custom development in house, um, you know, where you find, you find your teams or you find yourself, you know, building yet another authorization table, please stop doing that and take a look, take a look at your group. Um, so, uh, this is a, um, a diagram showing some of the components of, of Grouper. Um, and in the center there is kind of all the things we've been talking about, sort of delegation and rules and policy and audit and change log and subjects and um, groups, roles, and permissions. So that's kind of the heart of, the heart of Grouper, sort of managing all this data um, and providing that kind of functionality. Um, and then kind of around that, the, the light green are the, the various components that come with the Grouper software. So there was a question earlier about, well, how do I get how do I get this data out into LDAP? And um, so there's a number of different ways depending on your situation, but some of those components that we talked about was, for instance, the provisioning service provider um, up there in the corner. Um, there's also a sort of notification engine that you can uh, call out. There's also a change log that you can kind of look up to um, to push various changes out to particular systems. Um, the subject I, a, uh, API here that, um, you know, there's an API there that you can uh, plug in and read uh, JVC or Jindy, so you can read from an LDAP directory. Um, how, do I, how do I make Grouper aware of the subjects that I might want to stick in a group to, to begin with? So that's, there's an API for that. Uh, Grouper Loader is a, is a mechanism and, and a, a facility for, for loading groups from systems of records or for, for, from directories. Um, there's two uh, administrative components. There's a web UI that we're we'll, we'll going to take a look at in a second and also a Grouper shell that we'll show later on um, to provide kind of a management mechanism around Grouper. Um, you know, it's funny, in, in some of the, the commercial products in the commercial space, closed source commercial space around IAM, um, there's a little bit of buzz around IAM governance, which I, I, I found is kind of a funny way, funny way of talking about it. But what I think what they're really trying to get at is, you know, how do I, how do I take policy you know, for my organization and, and make sure that my IAM infrastructure architecture is actually implementing that policy. So how do I govern my IAM components? We talk about IAM governance. And, and Grouper has a fair amount of IAM governance already baked in, although we don't typically talk about it like that. Um, for the web services, you have a shibboleth on there. Is there a integration with CAS as well? Uh, right up top, the plugin. So, um, the PSP is actually built around the Shibboleth Attribute Resolver. Okay. And you can actually put the Grouper API into Shibboleth to resolve attributes directly to Grouper. Okay. Which is not a common way to do it, but okay. you can do it that way. Um, as far as resolving the CAS, but the question was. I was wondering, I'm not exactly sure what that does, but I saw Shublet up there, and I know Shublet is similar to CAS. Right. And I wasn't sure if that was, like, extremely important. If, there's, if it is, is there any CAS integration with that? Or? So the more common thing to do, of course, is that you know, Grouper does you know, some wonderful digestion and then publishes out to LDAP. Okay. And the nice thing about that is that CAS is very happy to draw <laughs> attributes from um, you know, we did a neat project doing role-based access control in CAS that did not touch group. And certainly in concept, that would be a neat thing to do, right? At your CAS single sign-on layer, if you had those requirements to be course-grade access control, to say only some groups of users ought to be able to log into this application. Well, wow, Grouper would be a nice tool to, to connect to do that, but that we haven't done that yet. Yeah, so th th this is actually a really, a really interesting use case because it is something, so the course grade access control, as Andrew talked about, is already supported in CAS. And um, you kind of implemented that for Fordham University. I think it was a presentation on there from last, from last JSIG. And um, we actually are working right now with the University of California, Berkeley. Um, they also want to implement this course grade authorization at the CAS layer. And they want to drive um, who gets authorized via Grouper. But the connection between CAS and Grouper is throughout that, right? They're going to publish VPN authorized you know, whatever the attribute is going to be into sort of a member of in their in their LDAP tree, and CAS is just going to read that. 
So it's probably the, the most likely way to implement that, that feature, even, even if, if you, when you're doing it with SHIN. Um, Do you have a SQL integration? What's that? Do you have a SQL integration? Yes, SQL science. Yeah. You, can, so you can connect to the grouper database and do queries, or you can write a, a really small data feed that mm -hmm. publishes to a database that has one. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, SHIP has this thing called Attribute Resolver, okay, which is really powerful. CAS has an analogous thing called the Person Directory, which, you know, is, has plug in an API to basically read from, from anywhere. So you could create a grouper database directly, you could plug in the grouper client, you know, you could do a variety of things. Again, I think for the coarse grain stuff, the likely scenario is just reflect in the LDAP and read from there. Um, but I guess the, there could be cases if you were trying to make use of a more sophisticated permissions model within Grouper where you need to go to the Grouper web service, you know, for limits. So there's, a, there's an idea of limits, you know, where it's not just you get it or you don't, but, you know, maybe you only get access during a certain time of day or, you know, you have some kind of other limit on the permission itself, in which case, right now, I think you need to would need to go to the web service. Right? Yeah, I think this diagram is actually uh, incorrect. I'll email Tom about it. Um, all the ones that say Grouper plugin um, are right except the Shibboleth one. I think the Shibboleth is actually the whole Grouper API inside of it, not the plugin that goes to web services. And the problem with that architecture in general is that if you ever do an upgrade to Grouper, you have to update your loader, your PSP, your web services, your UI, and now the API that's living inside your shibboleth, and I really don't think you want to coordinate that with your shibboleth team. Um, the right way to do it would be to, be to have a SQL interface or an LDAP interface or even the grouper client that uses web services. So that's one of the reasons why that's not, I don't even know if anyone uses that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. thing up here is this thing called toolkits that they have in the middle, which is a, this custom application that, that Duke built. Um, and what this does is, so this is another example of, of kind of uh, functional use cases um, and capabilities that arise out of a group deployment. And, and this is around ad hoc uh, collaboration. Be able, be able to create ad hoc groups um, and provision a variety of services for those groups um, in a way that end users can do, right? So this is an IT point this all together. And users can log into a, a web-based system that looks something like this. They can say, hey, I want to create, create a new group, give it a name. Uh, and um, then add various services and tools that are available in the infrastructure. So I'm going to create a group. I want it to have a chat room. I want it to have an email list. I want it to have a Sakai space. Um, and I want it to have access to some kind of virtual computer lab. And so I can add these tools. In, in an easy way to these various groups. Um, then I can manage who's in those groups. Maybe I can make use of some reference groups. I can do um, invitation to, for, and Grouper supports a, a feature called invitation. So folks who aren't already in your um, identity management system, but maybe your, your collaboration tools support some kind of federated authentication. Um, so I can add guests. Um, and so, um, you know, getting back to, hey, I, I just want to describe who's in the group, give them some simple roles, and then have that flow to all the various tools and systems that I'm going to provision for these groups. And we all know that those various tools and, and, and services, wikis and email lists and what have you, likely have their own proprietary authorization data model, their own proprietary API, maybe they can read LDAP, maybe they can read something else. And so, 
you know, having grouper in the, in the middle is, is one way to manage that complexity because I can then reflect out in appropriate ways and see various systems. Um, So there's a question earlier about some of the authorization stuff going into group membership. So this is an example from Chicago, from Tom Barton, um, showing you know some of these authorization uh, labels being pushed into um, the, the groups that the Tom has. So showing 145 items, um, pushing into memberships and LDAP attributes that then various systems can read. Um, Chicago is managing a lot of applications. This, I think, is one of the more, more impressive, impressive slides of, of the deck, um, kind of showing the, the breadth of, I imagine a lot of these things are, are via LDAP, um, but the point is they've, they've done, the, done the work to, to provide, to enable Grouper to manage authorization for all of these. Um, so yeah, that for now, and we're off to the head of So we've got about 15 more minutes to, before break. Um, and um, so probably might be a good use of this time is to, for the folks who want to kind of get hands on with Grouper and get the <coughs> Grouper installed locally, there's a, a Grouper installer that really kind of helps you walk through this. So, um, so for folks who want to do that, we'll take the next 15 minutes to, to get that going. And then we'll break at 2.30 and then we'll come back from that and we'll get a little hands on with that and then uh, turn over to Chris for Grouper in action at Penn. So, um, you need, a job need JDK. So you need a JDK locally. If you don't have one of those already, you need, you need that. And that somewhere convenient and unzip that. Google Grouper software, it'll be the first resort. <coughs> and eventually you should get to this. It's a uh, Grouper installer directory. It has a readme and a jar file. And the readme is going to tell you how to, how to run that. So you need the JDK if you don't already have that. Run Java dash jar Grouper installer of jar. It's going to kick off the, the Grouper installer, and 
it's going to ask you a series of questions. It's going to download a bunch of software. Um, it's all going to install. Uh, well, it'll ask you an install directory, um, so you can, you know, it all kind of installs in, in one directory. So you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's going to work in the whole system. Uh, it takes a few minutes to step through and download some of the software. So um, the folks who are doing that, if you have any questions or you feel like you're getting stuck, just you know, raise your hand or type up. The warning you will type in some passwords and some URLs, you might want to make note of those <laughs> uh, because otherwise you will go back and go, What did I set that password to? <laughs> and you'll be reinstalling. Or I think that you think there's a command, you can redirect it to the T, it'll keep, it, keep all your output, but what you did, you can go refer back to it, which is also a useful thing to do. So we have a few more minutes towards break, so I guess I'm, you know, for folks who aren't doing the install or other sort of thoughts or questions or how we're doing so far, things we want to try to tee up for the rest of the afternoon. Well, one of the things I, I was very, find very curious about the about Grouper is that it can read group memberships from LDAP or SQL, put them into Grouper, and then the PSP can turn around and put those things back into where it's got them from. And so you kind of have this symbiotic relationship between, I just read a group, you know, here's all these people who are a member of, who have the attribute of current student. And you get put in the current student group, and then you turn around and put those back into another group, which may be in the same OU as where I just got it from. And, I, and to me, then I, run, I, then I, as I think about it, I go, well, who wins? Who runs faster, the loader or the PSP? And so when you guys get a chance, you can talk about that whole flow of originating from LDAP and back to it. Yeah. And how that gets, what the challenges there are and how you keep things so they don't. Yeah, basically, the, what the loader is intended for is to take a system of record group that's managed somewhere else and be able to use that group inside of other groups or you know add or remove people from it and then have another overall group or just expose that through your group interface. And so you really can't have a group that's the system of record and the output as the same thing. So you need to separate out, separate out somehow in your OU equals group. Some of the groups come from you know, your HR system or something. They're not gonna come from Grouper. And some of the other groups you know, might be the output of a Grouper after people massage them or do what they want to them. Right. So, one of our, our problems is that um, we allow groups of people on campus to create websites, say like the Canoe Club. And they can get canoeclub.ufi.edu. And we have a active directory group that says, here are the people that have access to that Tomcat and can manage the content of Canoe Club and Utah Edu. There are 900 of these currently existing. And so we've loaded them up with Grouper into our Grouper loader. And now I want to tell the the manager of the manager told that John that okay now you have a way of managing of those things. Because it's all done manually now and it just has grown over years. Right. And I want to feed this back in for Grouper, back to those without having to go to the Tomcat for this there's some application we use for managing these Tomcat servers. I don't know if it's like Puppet or Chef or whatever it is. But I don't want to have to have them change their OUs to figure out where who has the rights to go manage the new club. You see you see I'm, like the limit here? And I'm, and I, I understand what you're saying. I'm perfectly happy to, okay, Canoe Club now is managing this different OU and make them change. We can just migrate this slowly. But there are others that say, oh no, we can't make 900 changes. Right. In the next reasonable, in the next century, anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah, we have this real, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's really Grouper's problem, but if anybody is real smart you. out there. Thank you. <laughs> think, think about it. I mean, That's we do have this issue of bootstrapping. I mean, how, you got these groups out there. You want to get the information, and now, now you want to start managing it I see. out there. And we don't have a really good answer. But that is, is you know, if it's one or two groups, you just stop everything, load everything, go. Oh. But um, yeah, we got 900 groups. We'd like to all of a sudden now they're being managed out here by hand with something. Um, now all of a sudden we want to put them in Grouper, and now tomorrow we want to start managing it. 
group are back to the same. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what you're saying. It's kind of migration. Uh, chicken and the egg problem, really. Yeah, so um, and I, I don't know that that's really groupers to solve, but maybe I'm going to get beat up on my team. But is it, is it a reasonable strategy to <laughs> load these groups into group group <coughs> and then you know, never load them again, but continue to manage them from group back to the same OU? Yeah. So I mean, as, long as, as long as you're not loading and, and yeah, you're not provisioning the same place. You can you can cut that <coughs> cut it over if you can manage that and get people to do it. Yeah, that's what you have folks here today, new lady and have that authority and you have that authority and you shut down. You don't have an honor for management. You better in use today. What does it say that we're lucky enough that Tim over there runs the AD team and runs our team? So we have a little bit of leverage in management in that respect, but it, this permeates beyond um, this management of these Tomcat servers we have in these wild and crazy websites. It also really comes down to our SharePoint installation. And again, we have a bunch of active directory groups covering all the department org IDs, or each department has its own SharePoint access. And the person that manages that is quite overwhelmed by this, and we have this same issue with SharePoint, much more so than the SharePoint is a big deal. I'm pretty sure that's not the real name. I'm sure it's no, I'm just UC colon one. apps colon VPN colon authorized. That would be the name of it. And then that would be, and then if you provision that to LDAP, that could be a number of attribute name or whatever. Just so like all the, the other groups. So it's the name of the group in Grouper. Right. When, when it's provisioned out to LDAP, it becomes the value of a member of attribute. Right. You're not pushing any of them to be user attributes. Th that would be like a flat structure. VPN would be like the flat versus mushy structure. Anything like that. Um, or am I wrong? Mm -hmm. well, what they so what is what does the member of look like? The flat versus mushy. Oh, okay. I was thinking like the the, the group the group, the group name, but the group name might might you know you might have to go down your user or whatever it is. But the stem names. Are 